armed confrontations in Karabakh and Ukraine have destabilized the post-Soviet space, creating a hazard of new conflicts arising along the entire perimeter of Russia's border. South Ossetia is one of such potentially explosive areas a small country located in the Caucasus which has been fighting for its right to exist for hundreds of years. South Ossetia along with North Ossetia, which is a part of Russia, could be considered the backwards of the world's politics if it weren't for the two strategically significant roads which go through the whole territory of both regions and bind Europe and Asia together. Establishing of control over these two arteries, Transcaucasian Highway and Georgian Military Road, is an important factor of ensuring international security in Cross. It was in 2008 when this area had to experience the latest full-scale war. Only a year and a half after the recognition of Kosovo's independence, conducted with the heavy support of NATO and the European Union. South Ossetia declared its independence 16 years earlier, but didn't receive any support. Does South Ossetia, in fact, have the right to be free? The relations between Georgians and Ossetians, historically known as Alans in the Middle Ages, developed in a quite typical way for any neighboring nations. Confrontations would often arise, but even more often alliances. The very peak of their relations took place from the end of the 12th the beginning of the 13th centuries, during the reign of Tamar the Great, the daughter of George III, Georgia, and granddaughter of the Ossetian King Cuddon. Tamar and her co-regent husband Ossetian Prince since David Soslan's reign is perceived as the golden age in Georgian history, but the relations between the two nations would soon change. Ossetian historical statehood The medieval kingdom of Alania fell to great conquerors of the past Genghis Khan and Timur. The remains of the population from the devastated cities and fortresses fled to impregnable mountains of the Caucasus where the conquerors couldn't use their main trump card large masses of cavalry. Fleeing to the mountains, though it preserved the Alans as a nation, forced them from now on to lead a tough 500-year fight for survival. Weakened by the Mongols and Timurids, though preserving its state, Georgia soon attempted to establish control over its former allies the Alans, who are known today by the Georgian name of Ossetians. Nevertheless, Georgia itself soon disintegrated into several principalities, turning into the arena of confrontations between the Ottoman and Persian empires for the next few centuries. Ossetian highland communities, on the other hand, began to establish complex relations of hostility and situational alliances with Georgian principalities dependent on Persia and the Ottoman Empire. The situation didn't change until the 18th century when a new force evolved in the South Caucasus the Orthodox Russian Empire, which instantly saw Orthodox Georgians as agents of Russian policies in the region. As a result of the following armed confrontations, Georgia was defended from the Muslim states and united by Russia into an integral state with large chunks of territories annexed from its neighbors. From this moment on Georgia became a stronghold of Russia in the region region, with its main city Tbilisi being a center of Russian imperial rule in the Caucasus. Father of Georgian nationalism, Prince Ilyashev Chavards elaborated on this issue. The hearts of all, young and old, women and men, were filled with the cherished hope that the arrival of Russian troops in Georgia would give it that peace, protection and patronage, that happy and quiet inner life, for the sake of which sons of Georgia heroically fought for centuries, generously watering every piece of their country with their blood. Since that memorable day, Georgia has found peace. The patronage of a great nation of the same faith destroyed the eternal Georgian fear of its ruthless enemies. Russian conquest of the Caucasus was predicated both by will of the Tsars to protect local Christians, Georgians and Armenians, and the aspiration to force the Turkish forces away from the Balkans, where Russia proclaimed itself a protector of Christians. New Russian authorities guaranteed Georgian aristocracy their feudal privileges, which incited them to use the powerful imperial troops for vanquishing of the Highlanders. Georgian political elite considered this change in the Caucasus geo 
geopolitical situation as a chance to dominate in the region. In 1802, Georgian nobleman Pavel Tsitsianov was appointed the commander-in-chief of the Russian troops in the Caucasus and instantly started to wage war against small independent nations of the South Caucasus. While serving as a commander-in-chief, Tsitsianov practiced senseless brutality against the highlanders of the Caucasus. His soldiers started to destroy wheat crops and drive away cattle of the highlanders in order they would also burn down the highlanders' houses. In Tsitsianov's world they should either obey the empire or die. One of Tsitsianov's most important assignments was the upgrading of the Georgian military road which went through the Darial Gorge historically inhabited by the local highlanders. Russian imperial rule in the region required permanent sustainable transport link with the new territories incorporated into Russia. However, the road leading to Georgia goes along the lands of highlanders. In Tsitsianov's mind, the only way to ensure stable military traffic from Russia to Georgia was an exquisite violence. Punish, stab, chop Ossetians without mercy, burn their homes, said his order to the commander of the Punishers, also Georgian Tornike Eristavi. The uneven military potentials of the Ossetian communities and the regular imperial army led to the defeat of the Highlanders and the expansion of the Georgians to their territory. In the next few decades the Russian Empire implemented the Georgian feudal system in South Ossetia, using brutal methods to overcome the fierce resistance of Ossetians. In order to economically stifle Ossetian peasants, the Georgian princes, supported by Russian troops, set reinforced castles even in the narrow gorges, and no Ossetian could pass them without being in danger of losing all of its belongings. For 50 years from 1802 to 1850, an anti-Georgian riots took place in South Ossetia every two to three years. They would be always suppressed by Russian troops with the assistance of Georgian militias. However, the resistance of the Ossetians still worried the Georgian authorities. The suppression of the rebellion in 1830 was remarkably violent. The commander-in-chief of the imperial troops in the Caucasus, Count Paskovich, ordered to organize a big punitory expedition against the Ossetians. Russian Georgian troops would soon start a true massacre of peaceful people of South Ossetia with the help of the artillery which the Ossetians didn't have. Vasily Potto wrote, The dead and prisoners appeared in the troops. Their number began to grow, and the soldiers were surprised to notice women among the fighting. Once, when the Cossacks were climbing a bare cliff, a young Ossetian girl suddenly jumped out from behind the stones and, like an angry tigress, grabbed the first Cossack she came across and strained all her strength to plunge into the abyss together with him. A terrible struggle took place on the edge of the cliff. Another moment and the Ossetian would have performed her selfless feat, but her strength was exhausted. She released her prey from her hands and fell alone into the bottomless abyss, where sharp stones tore her body into pieces. Viktor Chudinov, another witness from the Russian side, described the siege of the tower in the Ossetian village of Kola by Russian Georgian troops, recalling that three dozen besieged sang a cheerful song at the top of their lungs, tirelessly threw stones, mocked our efforts, and, apparently, preferred death to any mercy. Enduring a few assaults, the rebels heroically died in the battle. According to Potto, only the charred walls will show the curious traveler the place where thirty people defended themselves for about a day against a thousand and a half Russian detachment with Spartan courage. Using the power of Russian arms, Georgia finally got its way. South Ossetia was divided into four areas, each of them given under the rule of Georgians. The most disobedient villages were deported and resettled in Georgia to make their assimilations fast and sure. Ivan Apkazi, another Georgian on the imperial service, commanded a punitive expedition against the Ossetia in the North Ossetia in the same year of 1830. The scenario was barely different from the one in South Ossetia. The heroical defeat of Ossetians after a series of uneven battles against Russian regular army with artillery and senseless violence and bloodshedding afterwards. At the end of the day, Russian Empire gained a full-scale and unquestionable control over the road leading to Georgia. 
The only thing left to do was to simply clear it from the natives. The majority of the Ossetians were forced to leave this area whereas the Cossacks started to settle in. The Ossetians that stayed were going to be assimilated. The Cossack commanders were charged with the duty of promoting marriages of Cossacks with the Ossetians. Anyway, the Ossetians went on with their resistance this time as well. The Georgian prince Androny Koshvili precisely expressed their spirit at the time. The whole Ossetia is preoccupied with an idea of uprising. Ossetians are united in their fighting spirit and eagerness to fulfill their plans. In 1850, Androni Koshvili led another Russo-Georgian expedition to subjugate South Ossetia, but by that time, Emperor Nicholas I realized that it was impossible to bring Ossetians under Georgian rule. In 1852, the imperial governor of Caucasus Count Vorontsov informed the emperor, for more than 40 years, the Russian administrators of the region have tirelessly confirmed these rights of the Georgian nobility to rule Ossetians, acted according to them, sent military forces to subdue Ossetians to Georgian landlords, and looked for various opportunities to stop the resistance of Ossetians to the landlords and the government, but these hopes were in vain. Despite the total military supremacy of the regular army, the Ossetian Highlanders refused to obey. In the end, Nicholas I was forced to admit that life has proven that Ossetian Highlanders will never obey Georgian landlords without the use of military force. At the end of the day, we cannot agree to send their military detachments every two or three years. In 1852, the Russian Empire de facto recognized the independence of South Ossetians from the claims of Georgian feudals transferring local peasants to the category of state peasants personally free and entitled to self-government within rural communities. It hasn't brought an end to the confrontation though. The emperor still granted Georgian feudals the right own lands in Ossetia, which was absolutely denied by Ossetians in 1883-1884. Large-scale punitive expeditions devastated 125 villages in South Ossetia. Generations of Ossetian Highlanders kept fighting against tyranny till the Russian Revolution which led to the Civil War. Georgian socialists Mensheviks took advantage of the crisis, declared Georgia's independence, and laid claims to the territory of South Ossetia. South Ossetian authorities, on their part, denied these claims and demanded themselves the right of self-determination. In response, the Georgian Mensheviks unleashed terror against Ossetians and other national minorities. The witness of the events, British journalist Carl Becker Fur wrote, the free and independent social democratic state of Georgia will always remain in my memory as a classic example of an imperialist small nation. Both in territory snatching outside, and bureaucratic tyranny inside, its chauvinism was beyond all bounds. The rivals of Mensheviks in the Russian communist movement, the Georgian Bolsheviks led by Stalin and Ojanikidze, saw the Ossetian resistance as an opportunity to strengthen their own positions. Gradually, Ossetians and Bolsheviks began to see each other as natural allies against a common enemy, which led to the Bolshevization of the Ossetian national movement. Philip Makaradze, one of the leaders of the Georgian Bolsheviks, wrote, the Mensheviks didn't even want to hear about autonomy for the Ossetians. Ossetia must forget about this autonomy, it must enter the framework of Georgian statehood, it must recognize the sovereignty and great power of the Georgian people. Ossetians must refuse to use their language in school, in business relations, etc. In 1918, 1919, and 1920 there were new uprisings of Ossetians in South Ossetia. The unprepared revolt of 1920 provoked by the Georgian Bolsheviks was particularly tragic. As a result of the atrocities committed by Georgian troops, more than 8% of the Ossetian population of South Ossetia was massacred. Georgian guard didn't spare anyone, women, elders, 
children. Georgian government created a special resettlement commission which soon came up with a plan of deportation of Ossetians and establishment of settlements with Georgian colonists in Ossetia. Georgian authorities created a special commission to deport Ossetians. Here is one of its orders. Not a single Ossetian should be left in the areas where they traditionally live, even those who have received a certificate allowing their residence in the Republic of Georgia from the government, except for those who will be allowed to stay by a special order of the government. The head of the punitive troops Veliko Jugeli wrote about his atrocities rather openly. It's night and lights are visible everywhere. Houses of the rebels are burning. But I have already got used to it and have no emotions. Ossetians are fleeing to the mountains, to the snow mountains, and they will freeze there. We know what we're doing. We love freedom, our democracy, and the republic. We serve the cause of the liberation of the working class. For the good of the fighting working class. In the interests of the coming socialism, we will be cruel. I look at the ashes and clouds of smoke with a clear conscience and no regrets. In 1921, Georgia was Sovietized. Despite all the promises, there was no national emancipation in the USSR created by the radical communists. Just like the Russian Tsars before, the Bolsheviks proceeded with old imperial policies of subjugating the Highlanders to Georgia. During the tyrannical rule of and ethnic Georgian Stalin, South Ossetia experienced several waves of repressions against its politic and scientific elite, which opposed the state policy of forced assimilation of Soviet Georgia's national minorities. In 1938, Stalin had the Ossetian script in South Ossetia suddenly changed by the Georgian alphabet, while in North Ossetia, which was a part of Russia, the Cyrillic alphabet was introduced the same year. This made texts written in two pots of Ossetia in one language by the people of the same ethnicity mutually incomprehensible, along with the mass closure of Ossetian schools, this unprecedented measure was taken to tear the two branches of one small nation apart from each other and to force its assimilation. An entire generation in South Ossetia was stripped of the opportunity to get higher education as a result of the deliberate policy of Tbilisi, which once again use the mechanisms of the Soviet state to suppress and colonize national minorities. It was only with Stalin's death that Ossetians managed to get their unified written language back. In 1949, a group of Ossetian youngsters founded an underground organization, Justice, which opposed the forced Georgianization of the Ossetians in the South. They spread handwritten leaflets and proclamations in support of Ossetian schools and the right of the Ossetian people to speak their native language. It was a very dangerous game under the totalitarian regime. Soon the group was disclosed and its members sentenced up to 25 years in Gulag log camps. Shortly after Stalin's death, Lavrin Tiberia, the official and then unofficial ruler of Soviet Georgia and one of Stalin's main punishers, was arrested and executed. This was a severe blow for Georgian nationalists. Nikita Khrushchev, who soon came to power, condemned the Joseph Stalin's personality cult. This was perceived in Georgia as another insult from Moscow and a threat to its highly privileged position in the Soviet system. On March 7, 1956, Georgian students started a street rally in Tbilisi. About 30,000 people joined them very quickly. The crowd chanted, Glory to the great Stalin, and down with Khrushchev. At first, the authorities tried to calm the crowd, but it wouldn't disperse. There were calls for capturing the post office, telegraph and printing houses. Thousands of people stormed the Republican radio station and the city police department. Shooting began shortly afterward. Army units entered Tbilisi in response. The Stalinist revolt in Georgia was put down. Among the detained students was Zbiad. Gamsakudia, the son of Stalin's favorite, the writer Kote Gamsakudia, who was therefore an authority figure in Georgia. Sviad was soon released after his father pulled the strings. He will become the first president of independent Georgia and will organize a new brutal campaign against South Ossetia, costing Ossetians another 1,000 killed and over 2,500 wounded.
ensuring South Ossetia's economic stagnation in order to promote the exodus of the Ossetian population was an important element of Georgia's colonial policy in the Soviet period. A similar policy in Abkhazia another country handed over by Stalin to Georgia led to the fact that Abkhazians have become a minority in their own country. The strategy of Soviet Georgia's leadership in South Ossetia was to ensure stagnation in the economy and social life. Livestock products from South Ossetia almost entirely went to Georgia and its capital Tbilisi. Despite the fact that South Ossetia remained an agricultural region, the level of meat consumption here was 40 kilograms per capita per year, while the average number for Georgia was 77.2 kilograms. Level of dairy products consumption was 368 kilograms per capita in Georgia versus 200 kilograms per capita in South Ossetia. Those were also methods of provoking high rates of migration from South Ossetia. By the end of the Soviet era in 1989, 61 deserted villages were registered on the tiny territory of South Ossetia, which made almost 40% of all deserted villages in the Georgian Soviet Republic. Tens of thousands of Ossetians were forced to leave their homes and settle in more prosperous areas of Georgia, which allowed Tbilisi to pursue a policy of their assimilation more effectively. This policy created opportunities for a complete elimination of South Ossetia. On January 27, 1987, Mikhail Gorbachev, General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, called for reforms in the economic and political structure of the stagnating USSR, the so-called perestroika. Combining liberalization of public life and weakening the hold of ideology over people, Gorbachev Gorbachev sought both to prevent the approaching catastrophe and to preserve his own power as the head of the communist regime. Perestroika provided new opportunities for an active involvement of the people in politics, which consequently created new approaches to the communication of the weakening Kremlin and its critics. In the summer of 1987, as part of Gorbachev's declared democratic renewal of the regime, many dissidents were released from prison, including about a dozen of Georgian nationalists, they were sharply different from the nationalists embedded in the establishment of Soviet Georgia who appreciated the broad opportunities provided by the totalitarian state to suppress resisting minorities in Georgia. In October 1987 they created the first openly nationalist organization, the Ilyashevcha Vard Society. The name was chosen in honor of the pre-Soviet ideologist of Georgian nationalism Ilyashevcha Vards. In the same year of 1987, Shevcha Vards was canonized by the Georgian Orthodox Church under the name of Saint Elijah the Righteous. Soon, a group of extremists separated from the small organization, accusing the Ilyashev Chavard Society of liberal and passive approaches. The leader of this group was nationalist Spiad Gamsa Kudia. Gamsa Kudia, according to an old Georgian tradition, declared Ossetians the main threat to Georgia. This territory belongs to Georgia. It is historical Georgian territory. Ossetians are national minority and national minorities have only cultural rights in every country, cultural autonomy, and not political autonomy. On November 23, 1989, he sent a crowd of 30,000 of his supporters to South Ossetia. They were stopped before reaching Tskinbul, the capital of South Ossetia. The confrontation between nationalists, Ossetian authorities, police and the local population lasted two days and led to numerous victims, further blockade of the city and a new attempt of Georgia to destroy South Ossetia and its people. Yes, I organized that march. We wanted to move the Ossetians to reconciliation. Yes, the Ossetians are shot, which makes sense because they are criminals. Ossetians are retarded, wild people. Smart provocateurs can easily steer them. From this moment on, the modern phase of the Georgian Ossetian conflict begins. It eventually led, after three Georgian aggressions in 91 to 92, 2004, and 2008, to the declaration of independence of South Ossetia. Generations are changing and time is passing by, but Georgia 
Georgia's approach towards South Ossetia remains adamant in its desire of political destruction of the region and its colonization. Just like hundreds of years ago, Ossetians refuse to be subdued to Georgia, whereas Georgia does not recognize the existence of South Ossetia. Therefore, a new Georgian aggression against South Ossetia is always possible, and the confrontation is not over yet.